Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and welcome to my February wrap up. Today I'm going to be telling you about the books that I read in February. So February was quite an unusual reading month for me. I have 10 books to tell you about today, but seven of them I listened to an audiobook. Um, I only have three books that I read physically to tell you about. Um, so that is quite an unusual reading month for me in terms of format. Um, I do usually read a lot of audiobooks, so not usually that many more audiobooks than physical books. But there we go. It was an odd month. That's fine. So let's get straight into the books. And as always, I will start off with the classics. One thing I read in February was The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. This is a novella from the 1890s. Um, and a book that I haven't read for quite a long time. I think the last time I read The Turn of the Screw was probably 15 years ago. Um, and I reread this, I listened to it on audiobook, um, mostly because I was writing an article um, for an online magazine about like the best and worst governesses in literature. And I remembered that the narrator of The Turn of the Screw was a governess and I felt like I ought to mention the book but I didn't remember very well. So I thought I would reread it. I'll link the article down below if anyone's interested in a list of, you know, the best and worst governesses in literature. It was very fun to write. Um, but I wanted to talk about The Turn of the Screw and I just felt like it wasn't fresh enough in my head to do it. Um, and because it was on Audible, included in Audible Plus and was only like three or four hours long, I just thought I would reread it. And so I did. And I didn't really like it very much. I had in my head that I had quite liked The Turn of the Screw, but that I had decided that I didn't like Henry James's writing. I have read some short fiction by him as well, like some short stories. But rereading The Turn of the Screw, I did just think, actually, I didn't like it very much, but I really didn't like Henry James's writing. Like, I just didn't get on with it. In quite a similar way, I think, to how I feel about George Eliot, where I'm like, I can see that there's interesting stuff being done here, but the writing style is just so not for me um, that I'm just not invested. So yes, I didn't really enjoy The Turn of the Screw. The Turn of the Screw, if you don't know, is a um, ghost story about a governess who comes to this um, big grand spooky house to look after some children and weird things start to happen. And I feel like I should really like that. Um, if anyone has heard me lately talk about the premise of my novel, The Secrets of Hartwood Hall, it's quite similar. Um, and The Turn of the Screw was one of the books, like along with Jane Eyre and stuff, that was in my mind when I was writing The Secrets of Hartwood Hall. But like actually rereading The Turn of the Screw, I just don't like it very much. I just feel like Henry James's writing really isn't for me. There's so little atmosphere. The ending is so abrupt. And I feel like the governess's like weird crush on her absent master was just odd. And I just, I just didn't like it at all. So there we go, a very negative start to my wrap up. Um, but yes. It was a strange one. Another short audiobook that I listened to in February was Ghost Stories Volume 2 by M.R. James. February has actually been a very ghost story heavy reading month for me. In the middle of the month, I was part of a literary festival, the UK Ghost Story Festival in Derby, which was really great fun. I was on a panel and that was really enjoyable and really lovely. Um, and so I was kind of reading lots of ghost stories because of that. Um, as I said, there was another reason why I was reading The Turn of the Screw as well, but it did also kind of like help in my mind um, thinking about ghosts going into the Ghost Story Festival. And then I also read some M.R. James um, and two other contemporary ghost stories that I'll mention later. It was really interesting to read these ghost stories by M.R. James because he's an author who I've been meaning to read some ghost stories by for ages. He is one of the like very famous ghost story writers, I suppose. And my husband Nick and I decided to listen to some of M.R. James's ghost stories together on audiobook. And we ended up listening to volume two, not volume one, because um, volume two had within it a short story that was um, set in Barchester Cathedral, as in Barchester from Anthony Trollope's Barsetshire Chronicles. And it didn't actually have anything to do with Barsetshire um, and Anthony Trollope's book, but it was like set in his setting. Um, so we thought that would be quite fun to listen to. I quite enjoyed these ghost stories. I would say that M.R. James's ghost stories are the kind of ghost stories that are not scary and kind of aren't meant to be. They're more just like intriguing and curious. I think my favourite one was the story about a picture and etching that kind of like changed appearance every time you looked away. I thought that was really cool um, and quite creepy. But yeah, they weren't like the most chilling ghost stories ever, but they were really interesting to read, especially as M.R. James is such like a kind of founder of ghost stories in some ways. Um, he's an early 20th century writer, I should have said. Then moving a couple of decades later, this month I also read an Agatha Christie book. I listened to The Seven Dials Mystery on audiobook. This is a really fun Agatha Christie mystery. The book starts off with this big grand house party in the country um, and there is this character who everyone always mocks because he gets up really, really late. So his friends decide to play a trick on him where they set up eight alarm clocks in his room to all go off at the same time. But it doesn't seem to wake him because of course he has been killed in the night um, and in the morning 
one of the alarm clocks has gone and the other seven are lined up on the mantelpiece and strange things go on from there. I really, really enjoyed this. I would say this was a really fun Agatha Christie um, and just, yeah, really enjoyable. I will say that it is sort of the sequel to The Secrets of Chimneys. Both of these books contain the character Superintendent Battle, um, who is a detective figure who I really like in Agatha Christie. But I don't think there are many books about him in comparison to some of Agatha Christie's other detectives, but I did really enjoy meeting him again. And there's also quite a lot of characters that turn up in The Seven Dials Mystery that we saw in The Secrets of Chimneys. In general, I feel like it's absolutely fine to read Agatha Christie out of order, but I would probably say that it's worth reading The Secrets of Chimneys before you read The Seven Dials Mystery. The Seven Dials Mystery doesn't like spoil the solution to The Secrets of Chimneys, but there are several characters who you might have thought were suspects in The Secrets of Chimneys who are like um, removed from the suspect pool, I suppose, if you read The Seven Dials Mystery first because it will become clear in The Seven Dials Mystery that they were not the culprit in The Secrets of Chimneys, if that makes sense. But anyway, I really liked The Secrets of Chimneys. It was a really good fun read. Sticking with the 1920s, but moving over to the US, I also read two Harlem Renaissance classics this month. Um, so one was this. This is an anthology, Women of the Harlem Renaissance, Poems and Stories. So this is an anthology edited by Marissa Constantino, um, and it was a really, really interesting read. So this collection contains many short stories and poems from various African American women writing in the 1910s, 1920s, and I think 1930s as well. Um, and there were some absolutely fantastic st stories in here. I think my favourite short story in here was probably The Closing Door by Angela Well Grimkay, which is quite harrowing, but absolutely amazing. Um, and just, yeah, I feel like that's one of the best short stories I've read for a really, really long time. But in general, this anthology is just fantastic and really, really interesting. I'd highly, highly recommend it. Um, and it was also really nice to read like a collection of short stories and poems from the same time period and from the same like cultural movement, because I feel like I do sometimes read short story anthologies or poetry anthologies, but I feel like I don't often read poetry and short stories together and that was a really nice reading experience. And then because I was really enjoying this book and really enjoying reading more about the Harlem Renaissance and because there were a couple of short stories in here by Nella Larson, who's a real favourite writer of mine, that reminded me that I really wanted to watch um, the film that came out a couple of years ago of Passing by Nella Larson. And so I watched the film adaptation of Passing, which was absolutely fantastic. I thought it was incredible. It was so true to the book and so like man magnificently directed. I feel like the characterization was done so well. Like it's all done in kind of like sepia black and white um, and it's like square, not widescreen. Um, and the music is just amazing. It was such a fantastic film. I'd highly, highly recommend it. Um, and so yes, because I have been reading Women of the Harlem Renaissance, I then watched the film of Passing and then immediately thought, I really want to reread Passing now. So then I reread Passing um, by Nella Larson. And I didn't actually read this physically. I listened to this on audiobook because again, a bit like with the turn of the screw, there was an audiobook included in the subscription on Audible and it was only about four hours. So I listened to it on audiobook, which was a really 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 great experience actually because I just I think passing is incredible I read passing for the first time in 2020 and it's so short um, and I read it you know in a day in one sitting in fact I think I read it on one of my like reading days that I occasionally do where I try and like see how many books I can read in a day and I have been meaning to reread it since because it is so fantastic and it was amazing to reread and it was great to reread on audiobook the audiobook that Audible have is narrated by one of the actors from the film of Passing. I'll link that audiobook down below. I just think this is genuinely one of the best books ever written. Um, and I feel like the characterization is just utterly superb. I haven't actually said yet what Passing is about. Passing is about two friends who are both pale skinned African American women. Um, and one of them has been passing as white for a very long time and has married a white man who is very, very racist and doesn't know that she isn't white. And then the other woman, Rini, um, could pass but doesn't. Um, and this book is kind of what about what happens when Claire and Rini meet again and Claire kind of comes back into Rini's life. The characterization and the character relationships are just absolutely magnificently written and so subtle but clever. Like I feel like Rini is one of the best developed characters I've ever read. Um, and it was really nice to reread this after having just watched the film. One, because it did make me think just what a fantastic film adaptation it was and how true to the book it was, but also because I just think this book is amazing. Um, and it was just really lovely to listen to it and just like experience it again and just hear all the subtle, impressive intricacies of characterization that Nella Larson like puts into this book because it's so short, but it is also 
so rich and deep and I feel like the characterization but also the plot and the ending it's just amazing it was just such a great experience to like watch the film and reread this like two days later and yeah I would just highly highly recommend passing it's so short it will not take you any time and it's just it's just genuinely one of the best books ever then I also read an Italian classic this month which was this this is The Leopard by Tomasi de Lampedusa um, and this is an Italian classic from the 1950s as you might remember from my reading goals at the beginning of the year um, every year I pick a few different countries that I'm going to try and read a few classics from in that year. Italy was one of my choices for 2023 um, and so this is my first Italian classic of the year. The Leopard is a book from the 1950s um, but it's set in the 1860s and onwards and there are a few bits later on in the book which take place later on in time. It's about a man who is a prince in Sicily um, and about his experiences during the kind of unification of Italy in the 1860s and I guess the sort of driving question of the narrative is is sort of will he change with the times um, or not. I found this a really interesting book in some ways but I also found it very hard to get into like I feel like I felt at quite a distance from the book and the characters the whole way through. I feel like probably one of the reasons why I didn't read many books physically in the month of February is because this took me quite a long time to read and it's not very long um, but I was kind of just like struggling to get through it. I feel like it had some really interesting themes in to do with kind of class and rank and progress and nationality. Um, I feel like there were a lot of things in it that were very interesting um, and there was a kind of of like a bit of a love story going on with some younger characters that was very complicated and nuanced and was sort of a love story but also kind of a negative one and I feel like that plot I found really interesting but I found some of the other elements of the book slightly harder to get on board with. In some ways I found the politics interesting. Um, I studied like 19th century European history at university and I did look a little bit at Italian unification. I think I mostly looked at German unification. Like I think I wrote an essay on German unification and didn't write one on Italian unification. So maybe I just didn't remember very much from that module at university about Italian unification. But like I did know a little bit about the history and the politics behind what they were discussing in this book. But I just found quite a bit of the book quite slow or I felt like I ought to be connecting with the main character or interested in the main character more than I was. Um, so overall it wasn't like a fantastic reading experience but I'm quite glad I've read it and it was an interesting book. And yeah, I need to decide what I want to read next for other Italian classics. I definitely have The Betrothed on my list um, but I feel like that is like 800 pages so that may have to be later in the year <laughs> um, when I have a bit more time and I'm not reading three books physically a month. But anyway, on to the next book. Moving on to some modern literature, um, in February I read two historical fiction ghost stories, both of which I really enjoyed, um, and both of these I read for the UK Ghost Story Festival, which I was taking part in in the middle of the month, as I said. Um, so basically I was doing two events, I did a panel and a reading, um, and I was doing a reading with one other author, and I was doing a panel with three other authors, and of those four authors, two of them I had read books from before, and but two of them I hadn't, so I decided to pick up a book each from those authors to familiarise myself with their work before the festival and these two books were um, The Quickening by Rhiannon Ward and The Lost Ones by Anita Frank. I really enjoyed both these books and it was really interesting to read them back to back especially like with my own novel coming out as well because both of these books are um, historical stories um, with a kind of ghost story set up that begin with a woman going to a new big kind of spooky house for the first time for a particular reason and then a strange thing is starting to happen which is a setup I very much like and that is kind of similar to the setup of my own novel so it's really interesting to read them and it was also really really interesting to read them together because both of them um are kind of about World War One and about the shadows left behind by World War One and about the grief caused by World War One. So The Quickening is set after the World War One in the 20s and then The Lost Ones are set during World War One. So anyway, I'll start off by talking about The Quickening. Um, so this one is set in 1925 and it follows um, a woman who is a photographer. Um, she is pregnant, um, she's nearing the end of her pregnancy, but she takes on one last job um, as a photographer because she really wants to earn money for when the baby comes. And so she turns up at this big spooky house in the middle of nowhere where, um, in order to photograph a collection of antiques, um, of collectibles that this family have. And it soon becomes very clear when she gets there that this is a household that is suffering with grief. All the sons of the household died in the First World War. There is a grown-up daughter left 
um, with her two parents. There's also a spirit medium present in the house um, who is there sort of um, as the guest of the mother of the family. And there's clearly a lot of tensions going on in this family too. And meanwhile, our protagonist is also struggling with grief of her own. She lost her first husband in the First World War. She lost her two children slightly afterwards. And now she has started a new marriage and is about to have a new child. Um, but she's feeling a little bit uncertain about it all because she's still really strongly grieving for her lost family. And then of course, ghostly things start to happen and everything goes on from there. I really love the way this book looked at grief and the way the kind of like shadows of the First World War affect all these characters, I thought was really well done. I also really liked the way it looked at the spiritualist movement. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and the kind of like gothic atmosphere was just fantastic as well. So yeah, I really, really enjoyed The Quickening. Definitely one I'd recommend. And I would also really recommend The Lost Ones by Anita Frank. Um, so this one, as I said, was set during the First World War. So it's set in 1917. And we're following a young woman who is a nurse. Her fiance has died in the war and she is really struggling with it. Her parents are very worried about her um, when her sister, who is pregnant, asks her to come and stay with her. Her sister is living with her mother-in-law while her husband is working for the war effort. Um, and so our main character, Stella, goes to stay with her sister um, in a very big, spooky house um, where mysterious things start to happen. They learn very early on that a young child once died in this house. And so all the kind of mysterious occurrences that start to happen seem to lead back to that and to a kind of mystery in the house to pass. Like The Quickening, it looks really strongly at grief um, and the kind of effect that the First World War had on a lot of people and a lot of families. And I feel like that was done really, really well. There were so many interesting characters in it. I really loved the character of Mr. Shears, who is um, a young man who kind of comes to this house to like investigate the paranormal things going on. And he doesn't believe in paranormal things, but he also keeps his eyes open and is keen to observe. And I feel like he was a really interesting character and his friendship with Stella was really, really interesting. And I just really liked that dynamic. It was definitely a really interesting ghost story. And yes, um, as I said, it was really interesting to read The Lost Ones and The Quickening back to back because they did have a lot of themes in common. Sticking with historical fiction, another book I read and really loved in February was The Maiden by Kate Foster. Um, this is a proof copy. This is coming out in April this year. Um, and I think you should all be very excited for it. I really, really liked it. This is a really fantastic, compelling work of historical fiction. This book is set in the late 17th century in Scotland, um, and we're following two women. One woman that we're following is the young Lady Christian Nimmo, who we know from the very start of the book has been accused of murdering her lover, who was also her uncle by marriage. She has been accused of murdering him. She's been put on trial. Um, and if she is found guilty, then she will be killed by execution. She will be killed by the maiden which is sort of like an earlier form of the guillotine, I suppose. For a lot of the narrative, we are following Lady and Christian Nimmo um, her, in her cell in the present moment, but also her looking back on how she got to this point and what happened between her and the man that she has been accused of killing. But we're not just seeing the story from Lady Christian's perspective. We're also following a young woman called Violet. Um, and Violet has a very, very different background from the upper class Lady Christian. Violet works in a brothel. She has worked there for a long time when a very wealthy man comes along and says... Um, that he would like her to come and live at his castle for a while to be his private sex worker, basically. And Violet's story ends up crossing paths with Lady Christian's story. There was so much that I liked about this book. It's really, really compelling. It's such an interesting story. It's based on a true story as well, um, which I found really interesting. And there were just so many interesting themes. But I think the thing I loved about it most was the character of Violet. Violet absolutely stole the show for me. Um, like, it's interesting, like, reading the blurb. The blurb is all about Lady Christian. And I'm like, but this is not Lady Christian story. This is Violet's story. And I loved Violet. I thought she was such a fantastic, rich, interesting character. And her voice felt so distinctive and real. Um, and I really liked that Lady Christian's voice and Violet's voice are just so different. I thought that worked fantastically. And I just felt that Violet was such a wonderful character. Um, and the way this book kind of examined the class by looking at the very different lives of Lady Christian and Violet. I just thought that was fantastic. So I would really, really recommend this. It was such a great read. Really, really interesting. And yeah, Highly recommend this. It was great. Um, really wonderful new historical release for you to look forward to coming out in April. So the final thing that I read in February was this. This is Impossible by Sarah Lotz. This is a proof copy I have here, but it did come out in March 2022. So I've had this for quite a while, um, but I actually listened to it on audiobook in the end. Um, but I really, really love this one. Impossible is a love story, a kind of rom-com but it's much more complicated than that. Basically about 100 pages into this novel, there is a massive twist which changes the trajectory of the book a lot. 
And I feel like to tell you what that twist is, is a huge spoiler, so I won't. But I also feel like the twist is such a big hook that I kind of want to. But without giving too much away, I hope um, Impossible is a love story between two characters, Nick and B. They end up connecting online when Nick sends an email that ends up um, arriving in B's inbox, even though he meant it for someone else. They start exchanging emails and it becomes clear that there is something between them. So they kind of begin a friendship and keep on talking. And then, as I said, something happens happens 100 pages in and it ends up being quite a different book from the book you thought it would be at the start but it is at its heart a really fantastic wild roller coaster ride of a love story and I just loved it it is both like really powerful and a bit heart-wrenching and really fascinating but also just really funny and such a delight to read. As I said, the two main characters kind of connect through email. So a lot of the book is their emails. We have kind of first person narrative perspectives um, from both of them between the emails, but we do have a lot of their kind of correspondence as well, which I really, really enjoy. I would really recommend the audiobook as well because the audiobook has different narrators for Nick and B, And so we get to kind of hear their email exchanges between them um, in different voices, which works really, really well in the audiobook. I can't tell you about why it is such an amazing rom-com, but it really, really is. Um, but I'd really, really recommend it. Such a great read. Definitely one if you like an unconventional, slightly wacky love story. It's really, really good. And that's all. Those are the books that I read in February. Do let me know down in the comments um, if you've read any of these books, what you thought of them. And that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. And I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.